Okay, good afternoon. Sweetie pies and sour pusses. That's inconvenient. Noisy bastard. Let's try that again. Okay, good afternoon. Sweetie pies and sour pusses. My name's Danny. This is my own worst enemy. Mental health podcast. Okay, before we sort of jump into all this, um, I think I sort of owe you guys an apology. Um, regular listeners may know that um, the time to sort of refresh your podcast feed or when you get your YouTube notification, usually like a, a Sunday, Monday, every week. Uh, but just recently, you may have noticed I've kind of been publishing every nine, ten days, sort of spreading it out a little bit. And um, it's not because I'm being lazy. It's... Uh, I had a couple of cancellations, uh, people just cancelling their interviews on me, and usually when that happens I just sort of rearrange and, and crack on with it, but on both occasions this time, the people have cancelled on me right at the last minute, so the, the first person cancelled with like about an hour and a half notice or something like that, and then the second person gave me like 40 minutes, and there's just no way of me sort of rearranging that, there's nothing I can really do about that, so... Um, and also, I've been, you know, carry on sending out invitations and stuff, but with it being December, I'm getting people getting back to me saying, yeah, yeah, sure, I'd love to be on the show or whatever, but can we leave it till New Year? Everyone sort of wants to get Christmas out of the way. So, um, i kind of been left a bit high and dry at the moment, so um, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do to make up for that. I will come up with some episodes between now and New Year's. It might just be me talking bollocks for an hour, which, um, you know, we've done before and it went quite well, so... I don't know, we'll see, but I will make it up to you. Anyway, on with today's episode. So, um, I think I mentioned in the, the last episode that I've just started um, back at university um, at the grand old age of 35, and, and I'm studying psychology and philosophy. And um, I've got to say, one of, the, one of the things I love about this podcast is that even though I've, I'm, you know, I'm just getting started at university, just we're just sort of dipping our toe into the basics of things like Plato and uh, Socrates, things like that. Um, I don't have to work my way up to being able to sort of sit down with some of the great minds of the world. This podcast enables me to sort of, you know, jump the queue. And even though I know very little um, about philosophy at the moment, um, I still today I've got to sat down with with one of the you know, one of the top minds in philosophy in the world. And I just love that I get to I get to do that, even though I haven't got, I've not earned it, but I still get to do it, which is really nice. So my guest today is Professor Massimo Piliucci. Massimo is Professor of Philosophy at CUNY City College, New York. He is the co-founder and former co-host of the Rationally Speaking podcast and the founder of the philosophy blogs Footnotes to Plato and How to Be a Stoic. He's the author of a number of books, including Nonsense on Stilts, How to Tell Science from Bunk, Answers for Aristotle, How Science and Philosophy Can Lead Us to a More Meaningful Life, and the book which forms the basis of today's discussion, How to Be a Stoic, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Living. You can follow Massimo on Twitter. He's at M. Pilucci. That's at M. Pilucci, which is a little tricky to spell. So, as always, I will include a link in the show notes, which you can find at myownworstenemy.org or if you're watching this on YouTube just go into the, the show notes underneath this video there will be a link there I might even try maybe feeling a bit confident this week I might try putting a little graphic up on the video but don't bank on that I'm still very much learning um, also you'll find in the show notes the um, any relevant links that Massimo mentioned and uh, all his book recommendations as well and again on YouTube they'll be underneath the video so for now I think that's pretty much it I better scarp her off and go think of some ideas how I can entertain you guys in the weeks leading up to Christmas and the New Year. And in the meantime, please enjoy my conversation with Massimo Pilucci. Right, okay. Massimo Pilucci, welcome yes. to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me just check first. I bet you get this a lot. Ad nauseum. But did I get ever pronounce that okay? Yeah, that was pretty close. The G is basically silent. So yeah. Was, Massimo Pilucci. Okay. Yeah. Right. So today, um bit of a step forward for me this. So um it's 
been predominantly, it's a mental health podcast mainly, uh, but I've sort of expanded the remit into um, psychology and, and self-development. Um, today, we're branching out into philosophy, um, which I'm quite excited about, um, especially because of the, the hopefully the practical aspects of it um, and how it's going to apply to uh, mental health. But as always, um, before we go into all that, if you'd tell us a little bit about you, who you are, what you do, and um, how you came to specialize maybe in, in this particular topic. Oh, which is, I don't know if I mentioned it, we're talking about stoicism today. So over to you. <laughs> yes, we're talking about stoicism. Um, okay, the, the, the short version of the story is this. My, my background is actually in biology. Uh, I started out my academic career as an evolutionary biologist uh, working on gene environment interactions. So how genes and environments sort of interact together to, to create organisms. And um, after a little more than 20 years of that, I decided that it was time to do something else. So I went back to school, I got a PhD in philosophy, and then I switched fields. Uh, but my technical field of expertise in philosophy is actually philosophy of science, that is the study of how science itself works, uh, you know, seen from the outside. Um, so it has nothing to do with stoicism, really. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can't, it's just, I think, impossible to start studying philosophy seriously, uh, as you have to do if you go back to graduate school, especially if you're in sort of in the middle of your life. I mean, I was in my 40s at the time uh, and not sort of take in the, the broader picture and say, OK, and start thinking about the meaning of life and all that sort of stuff. And it, sure enough, the first two courses that I took uh, in graduate school in philosophy were on ethics and then on Plato. And I don't think you can read a book on ethics or on Plato without start thinking about your life, you know, more generally and outside of your career. Um, so I did that and I started sort of thinking about um, you know, these broader issues. And pretty, pretty soon I realized that there was one approach in philosophy, in practical philosophy in particular, uh, that really resonated with me. And it's called virtual ethics. Virtual ethics is the idea that ethics is not just the study of right and wrong, which is as you, it, it is usually portrayed in modern philosophy. It's really the study how to live your life. Okay, so according to the ancient Greek and Romans, uh, the most important goal of philosophy was in fact very practical. It was to tell you how to live your life, to 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 give you a compass, a guidance for. Uh, how to, to, to uh, live your existence. So I thought virtual ethics was very interesting and I thought this could be very uh, sort of useful for me personally. And so I started studying seriously and the first stop usually is Aristotle. Uh, it was fine, Aristotle is very interesting, he's one of the great philosophers. The problem with Aristotle is that he comes across as a little bit of an uh, aristocrat. I mean, he says that the good life uh, you know, in order to, to live a good life, you know, not only you have to be a good person, uh, but you also have to have a certain things, you know, a certain degree of education, a little bit of health, a little bit of wealth, even some good looks. And I said, ah, that, that just doesn't, doesn't strike me as right. Um, so I, I kept reading in, within virtual ethics. The next step was Epicurus. Epicurean philosophy is actually very interesting. I mean, I know that Epicureanism has a bad reputation because people think about sex, drugs, and rock and roll when they, when they hear Epicurus. But in fact, Epicurean philosophy was very, uh, very interesting. It, it had an emphasis on uh, friendship. Uh, you know, for Epicurus, the friend, having good friends um, is, is one of the most important things in life. The problem with Epicurean philosophy is, however, that it, since its main goal is actually to minimize pain in life, um, they basically advise people to stay away from social issues and from politics, because if you get involved in politics, then you're guaranteed to be in pain, uh, essentially. <laughs> um, that didn't strike me as right. I mean, I think that a human being has to be involved in political and social issues. I mean, I think that that's an important component of what it is to be human. So I got to that point. This is just the broad picture. I got to that point and I figured out, okay, virtual ethics is really interesting and it's important, important and it may be very useful, but two of the major philosophers that dealt with it, Aristotle and Epicurus, for different reasons, didn't quite do it for me. So about that time, this was uh, like four years ago or, or so, um, I was looking at my Twitter feed and, and I see this thing that says, um, help us celebrate Stoic Week. And I said, what the hell is Stoic Week and why would anybody want to celebrate it? 
But I was curious because I remember that the Stoics also were uh, into virtual ethics. So I said, okay, let's take a look. Turns out Stoic Week is an annual event um, that usually takes place in October or November. And it's organized by a group of philosophers at the University of Exeter in England, as well as a group of cognitive behavioral therapists. Because it turns out that CBT um, and similar kinds of therapies, therapies actually originated in the 1950s and 60s, taking their inspiration from Stoicism. So I said, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, right, that's interesting. So I, I signed up, I downloaded their handbook, I uh, read about Stoicism, I practiced some of their exercises, some of their meditations, uh, and all that. And then at the end of the week, I said, wow, this is really an interesting approach. This could really make a difference. So I committed to myself to, to keep doing it until the end of the year for another couple of months. Um, I got to the end of the year and my friends were telling me, hey, you, you, you don't get upset anymore. You, you seem to be very calm and very, you know, uh, cool with things. Like, what the hell happened? I said, ha, ah, let me tell you, I started studying stoicism. So since it was having actual really positive effect, I said, okay, let's commit for another year as an experiment on my on myself. And here we are now, almost four years later, and I'm still doing it. Um, so you were saying early on that you hope that this is a, a practical philosophy. Yes, philosophy actually interestingly started out pretty much from the time of Socrates, at least, uh, as a very practical kind of endeavor, as, as a way to improve your life and to improve society. Uh, and Stoicism is arguably one of the most practical philosophies. And it's interesting, this is a uh, sort of medical you know, health podcast, because a lot of the ancients, uh, especially the Stoics, but also Aristotle uh, and even Epicurus, made often a comparison between philosophy and medicine. They thought that philosophy was medicine for the soul, or, or as we would say today, medicine for the mind. Uh, I have a colleague at City College um, who, in New York who uh, says, who calls philosophy therapy for the sane. So it's like, you know, if you're a normal person, if you don't need, you know, if, if you have serious issues, you probably want to go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist and see what can be done, right? But, but once that the serious issues are some under control, you still have to live your life. You still have to make decisions about uh, what to do, what not to do, how to relate to other people, how to use your time, and so on and so forth. And that's where practical philosophy comes in. Okay, so first thing I'm interested in is whether, so did you come to study, did you, do you think you came to Stoicism purely from a sort of academic curiosity? Or was there, was there some necessity there? Was there maybe, was there something, because you said it something clicked with you. So was there, was there something maybe going on personally at the time that made you feel drawn to it as well as just academic curiosity? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was not academic curiosity at all. Uh, because as, as a semi-technical field, it's philosophy of science, not ancient philosophy. Uh, I was going through, the, through essentially what would you call, you would call it a, a midlife crisis. Uh, it was, you know, I was in my early 40s and, and my career was going very well, but it, it, it started to feel like I was coasting. I was doing always the same things and... You know, I needed some more challenges. I also uh, started to realize that, um, you know, if you're an academic, early on, your career is pretty, mu pretty much is your life because it is the kind of career that, that requires almost complete dedication. But after you've done it for a while, you know, I was reasonably successful as a biologist. I, uh, I had tenure uh, at a university, so I had job security and all that sort of stuff. Um, after a while, you say, yeah, but there's got to be something else going on in life with ju ju just my career. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. It was definitely a personal thing. It was uh, it was really a midlife crisis. Now, this wasn't the kind of midlife crisis where you, you find you, you find a younger woman in, in, in a sports car or anything like that. But I was you know, wondering about, OK, I'm in, in the middle of my life. And uh, what else do I want to do with the second half? You know, what, uh, what else is there to do? What else is, is it that it's interesting and it's important or relevant to do? Okay. So, okay, I think a good starting point for, for this would be to establish what Stoicism isn't before we get into the thick <laughs> of what it is. Because I think it's it's one of them it's one of them words that sort of, it's maybe used colloquially. I think, my, I don't know if that's the right term, for just being... A bit of a miserable bastard or someone who doesn't participate in things or just yeah. someone who's a bit grumpy and those sort of things and um so i've in doing the, the, the bit of research for this i came across um cynicism and asceticism which i think were maybe 
a bit more closely related to being grumpy. I don't know if that's right, but <laughs> if you could, like I say, if you could establish what Stoicism isn't first, yeah. uh, maybe yeah. link it to those two philosophies, and then we'll get into what it actually is. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question. So uh, first of all, uh, I distinguish, and lots of modern writers distinguish between Stoicism with the capital S, which refers to the philosophy, and Stoicism with the little s, which refers to the colloquial uh, term, you know, meaning of the term. And you're right, the colloquial meaning of the term uh, usually refers to somebody who goes through life as with a stiff upper lip, and who tends to be, if not grumpy, at least unemotional. The idea. Think of Mr. Spock from Star Trek, right? He's, he's the quintessential stoic with a little S, however, not with a capital S. Um, turns out that those are stereotypes that um, really were thrown, and even at the ancient Stoics, by their, their uh, adversaries, by their philosoph philosophical critics. Uh, but in fact, uh, they're not what the philosophy is about. So let, let's start by saying that Stoicism as a philosophy, it's not about going through life with a stiff upper lip, and it's certainly not about um, suppressing your emotions. Now, you mentioned cynicism. Cynicism also is actually has a similar problem because today the word cynic with a little c just means somebody who always says no, always is always negative about stuff, you know, who doesn't believe anything, you know, that sort of stuff. But in fact, cynic with a capital C, the philosophy was a philosophy very closely related to Stoicism. It was one of the of several Hellenistic philosophies. The, the other ones included uh, those that we, that were already mentioned, like Epicureanism and Aristotelianism, and there were there were a bunch of others. And um, cynicism was one of those. Cynicism was very very close to an ascetic kind of lifestyle, uh, but there was a difference, a big difference. So the word cynic in Greek means dog-like, uh, and that's because the cynics lived a life like a dog, meaning that they were living in the streets, they were doing everything in the streets, they were eating in the streets, they were uh, having sex in the streets, they were defecating in the streets. They were, they were just, they had, uh, um, they were a philosophical version of homeless people, but on purpose. <laughs> yeah. But on right. purpose not, yeah, not because they didn't have a home, they just gave up all the material possessions. Uh, they did not own a, a house. They usually did not have a family. There were very few exceptions. Uh, their point in life was just to live as naturally and as simply as possible and then to tell other people that this was the best way to live your life right. um, and there, there's a lot of <laughs> really funny stories about uh, the cynics uh, so here's one a, a, about just how minimalist the cynic lifestyle was right so one of the, the famous cynic philosophers was Diogenes of Sinope and Diogenes was going around only with a little backpack on his uh, of his possessions on his, on his shoulders, and that's it. He didn't have anything else, right? He, it's, he, he uh, slept in the streets in a buff tab or something like that. Okay, one day he's thirsty and he sees a you know a fountain uh, where there's, there's water, and and he, he takes his knapsack and opens it and takes out a cup to go and, and drink the water, and then he sees a young boy who uh, runs to the fountain before him, the young boy uses his hands to, you know, he cups his hands and he drinks from the fountain straight with his hands. So Diogenes looks at the boy, throws out his cup in anger and says, look at that boy, he's wiser than I am. Meaning that he has to figure out a way to live even more simply than, than I am doing. So that's the kind of people that the cynics were. In a sense, they were ascetic because asceticism is in fact a kind of a minimalist uh, approach to life. It's, it's like where you want to concentrate only on your sort of spiritual development and, and you do away with most or all um, uh, sort of external goods. The difference I think between an ascetic, uh, let's say in, in the sense in which Christian monks might be ascetic, for instance, uh, and a cynic is that ascetics typically stay on their own. Right, so they go, the typical, the stereotypical image is that of a, of a Christian monk up in a monastery in the mountains where in a place, or a Buddhist monk, a, a similar situation where, you know, it's an inaccessible, they're there on their own, they're completely detached from the rest of the world and they just, you know, pray or think or meditate. Like that. The cynics were right in the marketplace, they were right in the middle of the city, right in, in front of everybody. Um, because their point was that, um, the important thing in life was, in fact, to convince other people that they were wasting a lot of their time and energy going after material objects, that the, that the real life was actually a simple life. So the cynics were very much, um, uh, uh, you know, practical philosophers in the, in the, in the you know, real sense of the world, of the word. 
Now, finally, let's get to Stoicism. So the Stoics admired the cynics. Uh, the, the Stoics said, yeah, that's, that's actually, you know, it takes guts to do that sort of stuff, and it takes determination to do that sort of stuff. But they say, but it's not necessary in order to live a, a good life, to just do without everything and live in the streets and things like that. It's fine if you have a house and a family and uh, friends and, you know, children and, and a career. These are all things that normal human beings want and that make normal human beings happy. Uh, but, they said, all of those things are, and they use a, a really deliciously oxymoronic phrase, they refer to those things as preferred indifference. And you, you, you hear that and say, wait, how can something be preferred and yet be indifferent, right? Is that mm. seems like a contradiction. Um, they meant that other things being equal, uh, those things are preferred, meaning that uh, surely it's going to be better for you if you're healthy rather than sick or wealthy rather than poor or educated rather than ignorant and so on and so forth, right? So, so those things are preferred, other things being equal. But they are indifferent, meaning that they make no difference to who you are as a person. Who you are as a person, according to the Stoics, is only and exclusively a matter of your moral character. You're either a good person or you're not. Uh, and if you're a good person, it doesn't matter whether you are wealthy or poor, uh, healthy or sick, educated or ignorant. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that you are a, a good person. Um, it also, conversely, doesn't matter that you're wealthy if you're also a bastard. Okay? Uh, you, being wealthy doesn't make you a good person, uh, essentially. So a, a fundamental aspect of Stoicism is that the most important thing in life is to cultivate your own moral character, to be a better person, okay? as good a person as you can. That's the, the crucial thing. That's the overarching goal of, of Stoic philosophy and Stoic practice. The rest, if it comes, it comes. If it doesn't come, fine. You can, you can live without it uh, regardless. You can live without uh, some external, you know, some material uh, things. It doesn't really matter because they don't affect who you are as a person. Okay, so, well, the obvious, obvious question to, that arises out of that then is what, according to the Stoics, um, makes a good, a good person? What are the, you know, the, the Ten Commandments or the Five Pillars or anything like that? Right. Uh, yeah, great, great question. So um, the Stoics did have an answer to that, and the answer was inspired directly from uh, Socratic philosophy. They, they, they thought of themselves as actually followers of Socrates. And a lot of their philosophy is, uh, is an elaboration of Socrates. So they thought that a good person is a person who practices to the best of his or her abilities four fundamental virtues. Those, those are called the cardinal virtues. And the cardinal virtues are practical wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. So let me explain briefly. Practical wisdom is the ability to navigate complex situations in the best way possible. Uh, life is complicated, and there's always going to be trade-offs. So in my life, for instance, I want to be a good partner to my companion, a good uh, father to my daughter, a good teacher to my students, you know, a good friend, and so on and so forth. But there's only 24 hours in the day. There is you know, only so much in the way of energy and resources and time and so on and so forth that I have available, so I have to strike compromises. And practical wisdom is the ability to strike the best possible compromise given your goals in life. Um, so that's the first virtue. The second one is uh, courage. Courage, we're not talking about the courage of you know, rushing into battle uh, or anything like that. We're talking about moral courage, the courage to do the right thing. Now, uh, this doesn't have to be a high and lofty, you know, high-minded and lofty thing. I mean, that, you know, people often think, uh, I don't know, Nelson Mandela opposing an apartheid regime in South Africa. Yeah, that's great. I mean, he was a great person. But, you know, most of us don't, don't need to oppose, you know, apartheid regimes in, in our country. We, we have much more mundane problems. But nonetheless, today, we are, in fact, facing um, morally salient interactions with other people. If you talk to a colleague, uh, and you don't treat him well, you're not behaving well, you're not behaving, uh, you know, courageously, um, you're, you're not, uh, if, if, let's say a colleague of yours gets um, uh, mistreated by your boss, or, or there's a sexual harassment, which these days is apparently happens every, every other minute. Um, if somebody is being not treated well, and you don't intervene, and you don't do anything about it, right, then you're not being courageous. 
So it's that kind of courage. It's the courage to intervene and to do the right thing, at a, even at a very small level, at the local level of people you actually know and interact with. So that's the second one. The third one is uh, uh, justice. Justice is basically about treating other people right, treating other people the way you want to be treated. Um, so again, this happens every day. Uh, you talk to your colleagues, you talk to a friend, uh, you talk to a stranger. Well, the way you interact with these people should always be with uh, keeping in mind that these are human beings that are worth something just because they're human beings. They're, they're not, you know, you, you don't use them for your own purposes. You respect what they are and who they are on their own terms. So that's the idea of practicing justice. And then finally, uh, the fourth virtue is temperance. Temperance is the idea that you do things in good measure. It's about self-control. Uh, you don't do things too much or too little. Uh, you don't, uh, you know, any, anything that you, are, that you embark in doing, anything you decide to do, any project that you do, any of, of your activities, you have to strike the right balance uh, toward not overdoing it and not underdoing it. So the Stoics thought that if you practice every day these four virtues, practical wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance, then you become a better and better person. Uh, the goal is not to become perfect. Uh, the, the Stoics had a word for a perfect human being. That, that it was the sage, and uh, the sage is this you know perfectly wise person. It's like uh, similar to the Buddha in in stories in sorry in Buddhism, right? Um, and they said, okay, look, uh, we don't know if anybody ever did become a sage. It doesn't matter. The point is not to become perfectly wise. The po point is to become a Seneca, who is one of the major ancient Stoic writers, put it. The point is to become better than yesterday. So the, the idea is that you improve little by little by practicing the four virtues. Okay, I've, I've got to say, just on the on the face of that, those sound like sort of common sense ideas. Um, so I'm just wondering, was was Stoicism the first sort of philosophy to come along to actually really sort of make a thing uh, of these ideas? Or to, to make it, you know, in order to actually qualify as a Stoic, you have to have to, to live by these four pillars. Do, do you know what I mean by that? It just sounds like or maybe it's just to the modern ear. Maybe it, it, back then it, it wasn't quite the same, but it just sounds like, well, they yeah. sound quite obvious. Yeah, they do sound quite obvious. They were, in fact, the first ones to elaborate those ideas in, in these terms. Uh, although the concept of virtue, of course, predates the Stoics. The concept of virtue goes back to Socrates, as I said, who lived about a few decades, really, before the beginning of Stoicism. But the Stoics were the first ones to sort of put it together into a, into a coherent, coherent system. There's another fundamental idea about Stoicism that we haven't talked about yet, and, and we'll get to in a minute. Um, but one of the reasons this sounds like common sense to you and to us in general um, is because, in fact, a lot of the Stoic ideas were incorporated by Christianity. So um, and, and so they become familiar. So uh, there, there's two or three examples of this. Um, and uh, one of them is that in, Christians recognize seven virtues, not four, but seven. And this is because of the work of Thomas Aquinas uh, back in you know, the high Middle Ages. And if you look at which, which uh, virtues the, the, the Christians recognize, those are the four Stoic ones. They got it straight from the Stoics. Um, you know, the uh, Aquinas and um, uh, Paul, as well as um, um, Augustine, they all read Seneca. They all read the Stoics. They were very aware, uh, and they discussed them, in fact. So they take over the four, these four virtues because they thought those were important for character building, basically. And then they added three more, which are, faith, hope, and charity. And these are the, right. the more standard sort of Christian virtues. So, so one reason uh, this all feels familiar is because it is familiar. Um, it is, uh, you know, through the Christian tradition. Also, there are similarities with other philosophies, and that's another reason why this may sound familiar. Um, the, the one way to explain the, the Stoic path to virtue is to think that it is very similar to the Eightfold Path uh, of, uh, of Buddhism. If, uh, you know, Buddhists have eight sort of director, you know, eight things that they're paying attention to, but in fact, those eight things can be uh, reformulated as uh, essentially equivalent to the four virtues. So this whole thing, um, it, it sounds very familiar because in several different cultures over the last 2000 years have essentially hit on the same, um, uh, you know, points over and over. 
Another reason why Stoicism sounds very familiar is because one of the main Stoic, Stoic texts um, is the Enchiridion. The Enchiridion is, is, uh, translates as the manual, the handbook. And it's by Epictetus, who was um, a slave, actually, in uh, second century Rome, and then eventually was freed, and he became one of the most uh, successful influ influential teachers of antiquity. Now, the, uh, the manual, Epictetus' manual, was adopted and used by Christian monks throughout the Middle Ages. The only difference uh, that, uh, is that in the Christian version, every time that the word Socrates appears, it is actually replaced by the word Jesus. But other <laughs> yeah, than that... Of course it is. <laughs> yeah. But other than that, it's the same book. So, again, that's another reason why... Uh, so things sound very familiar. The third reason they sound very familiar, and that allows me to introduce the second big uh, concept in Stoicism, is because of something called the dichotomy of control. Uh, you probably heard of uh, the Serenity Prayer, right? So the, the Serenity Prayer is, this, uh, is a modern Christian prayer that it's usually adopted by 12-step organizations like Alcoholic Anonymous and things like that. And it's there. It, I don't remember. I never remember exactly what uh, the, the wording, but basically it says that it asks God to give you the uh, wisdom to realize that certain things are under your control, other things are not under your control, and that you need to sort of accept the ones that are not under your control and then have the courage to change the ones that are, right? That, now, that prayer goes back to the early 20th century. Um, but you will, find, you will find other versions of it. Uh, one in, in 11th century Judaism, another one in 8th century Buddhism, and the most ancient one is in 2nd century Stoicism. Um, right. That particular sentiment is exactly how the manual of Epictetus starts. If you read uh, the Enchiridion 1.1, the, the very first paragraph of the Enchiridion, it says some things are up to us and other things are not up to us, and then it lists the things that are up to us and the things that are not up to us, and then it tells you what to do with them. So, this is called the dichotomy of control. It's a very Stoic idea. It really originated apparently with, uh, with the early Stoics, uh, with Zeno of Citium, who was the first, the founder of Stoicism around 300 BCE. And the best way that I can explain it is this. Um, essentially, the dichotomy of control says that we don't control almost anything except our judgments and our decisions to act, okay? So even things you might think you control, like your body, you say, yeah, all right, of course I control my body. I can, I can go to the gym, I can eat healthy, you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, but the Stoic would say, no, you can only influence your body. You don't really control it because then a disease strikes and then it doesn't matter what you did up to that point. You know, you got the disease or somebody, or you break a leg because of an accident and that's it, you, know, you, you don't control your body. Or your reputation. You know, most of us would say, well, of course I control my reputation. I can do certain things and not do other things. And that's going to be reflected in my reputation. Sure, you can influence it. But again, something can happen outside of your control that is going to ruin it completely. Um, you know, somebody is going to accuse you of something you didn't do, for instance. And now your, your, your reputation is marred for the rest of your life. So everything pretty much is not under your control, meaning that you can only influence it, but you don't determine the outcome. So what does that mean in practice? In practice, that means that you need to, that the way to, to live your life, according to the Stoics, is by internalizing your goals. And there's a beautiful metaphor that uh, Cicero came up with uh, that explains this thing. Cicero was not a Stoic writer. Um, uh, he was um, more sympathetic to the sort of uh, academic uh, skeptics, which were sort of a late followers of Plato. But he was also sympathetic to Stoicism, so he wrote a lot about Stoicism. And, um, and uh, he, he came up with this metaphor, the archer. He says, so imagine you're an archer who is trying to hit an enemy soldier, okay? You're in battle, and you're trying to hit the soldier, to, to kill the soldier. Now, what is under your control, and what is not under your control in, the, in, that, in that kind of circumstance? Well, what's under your control is to, of course, before the battle, to do it the best you can in order to, you know, exercise, to, to practice so that you can get your best shot, right? So you can put your efforts into practicing. Once you are in, in the battle, oh, oh, you also can pick the best arrows, right? You can, you can uh, make sure that you have the most polished and the most you know, aerodynamic arrows. You can take care of your bow. Uh, you, can, you can make sure that the strings are, you know, it's, 
they're really tense and so on and so forth. Um, then once you're at the moment of taking the shot, what's under your control is your focus, the moment, uh, you know, the strength of, with which you pull the arrow. The moment you let the arrow go, however, that's it. Everything else is entirely outside of your control. You can have the best shot that you, you can imagine, and yet a gust of wind comes in, and so all of a sudden you missed. Or you were aiming very well, but you know what? The enemy soldier is not stupid. He turned around, he saw you, and he's ducking, and, and, and you missed the shot, right? So the idea is that there is this, this difference between your internal goals, what you, you, what you completely control, and therefore what you should be satisfied with, is that you've done your best. Then, as far as the outcome is concerned, sometimes it's going to go your way and sometimes it's not. That's just life, okay? And if it's going to go your way, you gladly accept that the universe has decided that that way you're winning, that that day you're winning. And if it doesn't go your way, you also accept the fact that the universe has decided that you're not going to win that day, right? So you take things with equanimity. You don't take either too much credit for what you do, because after all, uh, only part of the, of the outcome is the result of your efforts. The rest is luck. Uh, but also you don't blame yourself if you fail, because as long as you did your best, did your best, then what else was there to do? There's nothing else that you could possibly have done. Uh, sometimes just things don't go your way. If you internalize that idea of the dichotomy of control, the Stoics thought that you're going to have a really happy life. Not happy in the sense of, oh, I'm happy, you know, I feel good about things, you know, not that kind of happiness. But the kind of happiness that comes from knowledge that you are doing your best. And that also and from acceptance that you live in a world where you don't control things. Uh, and and it's, you, there's no reason in blaming yourself if you've done your best. And there is no reason to brag about stuff if you actually succeed, because, you know, your success is always in part the result of luck. Right. Okay. Well, we're, we're getting into the, into the thick of it now, because um, when, I, when I emailed you, I said that I'd, what I'd like to do is sort of root this in um, what, I, what I think are sort of broadly the, the three main problems with, in, in mental health. Well, say if we've got depression and anxiety, they're the big ones. They're the ones that most people listening to this podcast are, are struggling with those two. And right. sort of the, the driving forces behind depression tend to be um, regret, looking backwards, and then looking forwards, but into hope, with a sense of hopelessness, like nothing's ever going to get better. And also with, with anxiety, it's, it's worry. It's wanting to be in, in control, worrying about the future, what's going to happen. Right. And... What I'm interested in, so it, it, just digging into that particular idea a bit more, because that very much applies to the to this the idea of the concept of anxiety, is it's in theory it's great, <laughs> but like you say, there's this you, you have to get to this point of actually internalizing this yeah. idea. Right. What what's what do we have to do to to get to that point? And and also what, what I'll throw in there is. Another another way it sounds sort of, if you, if you take it in the idea of maybe going for a job interview, right. something like that, and you don't get the job and you're going to be out of work for a few months or whatever, that's, it's, it's, it's intuitive to see how you could actually, you know, if you concentrate on it, if you, you make the effort, you can take a step back from that and say, well, you know, certain things are out of my control. But say when we're, we're pushing these ideas to the sort of logical conclusion, let's say something like losing a child, you know, are we, right. yeah, are we seriously expected to still be able to apply the idea in that sense? I know that's a very broad, all over the right. place question, but I'll, I'll hand that over to you. Yeah. No, those are excellent questions. Let me start with the tough one, which is the, the last one, right? Um, are, you, are we seriously expected to, uh, to apply that also to tragedies such as the loss of a child? And the answer is yes, you are. Uh, right. Now, that said, um, and the Stoics are pretty clear, um, let's say Seneca, for instance, is, in particular, is very clear. Seneca wrote three uh, sort of, or essays, I should say, uh, that are called uh, consolations. Consolations, meaning that he wrote to a friend of his who had lost his, uh, her son, one of her sons, 
Uh, and then he wrote to his mother, actually, who was distraught because Seneca was in exile uh, and she was unhappy about that. And then he wrote to a friend of his who lost his brother. Right. And uh, and what he's trying to do is, is to provide stoic counseling, essentially, for these people. And he's very clear. He says, look, of course you feel distraught about son or your brother. You know, they, it, it would be inhuman if you didn't. That would be, you know, nobody's canceling you to not care or not feel grief or anything like that, because that would be, first of all, that's impossible, he says. And if there's one thing that the Stoics are not after is the impossible. If, you, if something is outside of your control, then you don't even try. And, and feeling grief uh, at the loss of, a, of, a, of a, a loved one is outside of your control. You, there, there's nothing you can do about it. It's a natural human emotion, right? What you can do, however, and what you should do, is uh, slowly but surely to uh, sort of reflect on the situation, accept it, and then move on. All these cases where he's writing to these people, those are cases where the grief had basically festered. The grief had become a thing in and of itself. The woman, Marsha, who, is right, who Seneca is writing to, had lost her uh, son like two years earlier, or two or three years earlier, and she was still deeply in grief, unable, basically paralyzed, unable to do anything with her life, right? At that point, Seneca says, okay, this is the moment where you really need to snap out of it. Um, you really need to, uh, to accept what has happened and move on. And he said, and the reason you need to do that is not only because it's inevitable, it's not, you know, you're not doing any, any favors to anybody, you're not bringing your son back to life, obviously, in this way. You're also not doing any favor to yourself because you're just completely overwrought by something that you cannot do anything about. But also, importantly, he says, you're now neglecting your duties to other people. You still have other children. You have your husband, you have your friends, you have your place in society, you, you have to do things. And uh, this thing is paralyzing you and that is where the problem is and that's why you wanna get out of it. So it's actually a very humane kind of approach. Uh, yes, technically you ought to quote unquote, get over the, the, the death of loved ones, right? But not in the sense of, oh, I don't give a damn, I just lost my you know, husband and that's it, too, too bad. Not in that sense, but in the sense of, Equanimity, acceptance, you know, these things happen. Uh, they are unfortunate, but they're part of life. Uh, you know, we all die at some point. Yes, it is tragic when it happens to you, but, but um, Epictetus is kind of, Epictetus was a little bit more of a hard-nosed stoic. It, it was a little bit more, so Seneca is much more compassionate. Epictetus, when he talks to his students, he's, he's a little bit like, sort of, um, uh, he tries to shake them up of their, of their, of their, shake them out of, of their beliefs by being a little bit ag aggressive, right? And um, so Epictetus says, um, uh, in the case of grief, like, so what did you think that that um, uh, that these kind of things was not going to happen to you? I mean, it happened to everybody. Just look around, right? Everybody has lost somebody, um, and so it's not about you. It's not that the universe is 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 after you. It's just it's a normal thing about human life. And then he says. Uh, and this is an interesting point. He says, look at how you yourself react. Have a loss. What do you do, right? So the first thing you do is, is you, you, you uh, if you're a normal person, you display compassion, right? You say, oh, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, this, this uh, is awful, blah, blah, etc." But after a while, you say, okay, it's time to move on. It's time to, uh, you know, get, get back on the saddle, so to speak, and, and get back into life, right? Uh, in fact, often we make comment when other people uh, experience tragedy, we make the comment of, well, you know, it's unfortunate, but that's life. Why, why therefore not be fair and apply that comment to yourself? Mm. When, when something happens to yourself, just react in the same way in which other people, in which you react to other people, not dismissing it. It's not a question of dismissing it. It's a question of just accepting the reality and trying to do your best. So that was the tough part of the question. Now, let me go to uh, the bit about depression and anxiety and so on and so forth. Uh, there actually are several Stoic practitioners who do suffer from anxiety and depression and they have written um, uh, about it publicly. So if you go, uh, if your listeners go to uh, the Modern Stoicism website, for instance, which is a, a blog, um, it's, it's one of the major blogs on Stoicism, they will find several examples, several testimonials of people that actually um, have uh, used stoicism to deal with depression or anxiety. 
if they go to my blog, uh, hardbeastoic.org, uh, there is a uh, section of that blog that is called uh, Stoic Advice. And it's just, basically, it's an advice column. And several of the people that wrote to, that written to me um, are, in fact, suffering from anxiety, depression, or other uh, mental conditions. And, in fact, there is a chapter in my book, which is also called How to Be a Stoic, um, which is explicitly about stoicism and uh, you know disabilities, both physical and mental. It's also uh, a part of that chapter is about physical disability. Now, the general answer there is, I think, threefold. It, first of all, it depends on how severe the problem is, right? So let's say, let's talk about depression first, all right? Um, so if, you, if your depression is really severe, like you have suicidal thoughts and, and you know, it's, it's been going on for a significant amount of time and you don't seem to be able to do anything about it, probably the first stop ought to be a um, medical professional. Right? You probably ought to go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist and if need to, need be, take medications for it. Um, you know, I'm somewhat skeptical about uh, you know, medications in psychiatry. I think there is a lot of overuse of it and that sort of stuff. But, you know, for crying out loud, certain times you really need it. Uh, some, sometimes they, they, that's the kind of the first aid. I, I would refer to that as sort of first aid kind of thing. You want to bring your mind back to a place where it's at least manageable or at least to sort of beginning to be manageable. That's the first stop. The second stop um, again, if it's fairly severe and if it's the kind of thing that you don't, don't seem to be doing, be able to do much to, on your own, then go to a CBT practitioner, right? So this, that's cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, as I mentioned earlier, cognitive behavioral therapy actually got started in the 1950s and 60s uh, by people like Albert Ellis, and they were directly influenced by Stoicism. Ellis had, had read uh, you know, Seneca, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius. And some of the standard techniques in CBT are actually derived, they're modernized version, of course, and they're empirically based versions of insights that the Stoics proposed. Um, the idea of cognitive behavioral therapy, it's called cognitive behavioral therapy for, for a good reason, right? The, the first step, step is cognitive. That is, it's, you have to acknowledge that there is a problem. Uh, going back to the serenity prayer and, the, and why it's used by alcoholic anonymous, right? The, the first step in alcoholic anonymous is to acknowledge that you have a problem, right? So the idea is you convince yourself, first of all, that there is a, so cognitively at a, at a thinking level, you say, yes, I do have an issue here and I need to work on it. The second step is behavioral. What the therapist will do is precisely what the Stoics suggested you do. Uh, you don't change your behavior just because you understand that there's something wrong. I mean, people that are depressed presumably know that they're depressed and they know that that's not a normal uh, condition, but knowing it, it's not enough. It not, doesn't, it doesn't really make a difference. What makes a difference is to be, begin to behave differently. Um, so the CBT uh, practitioner typically uh, will actually give you worksheets, like, like homework assignments. It would say, you know, okay, this week, try step one, step two, try to, do, to engage in this kind of behavior or that kind of behavior. Uh, in fact, it's, it's CBT is, is empirically very effective uh, with both depression and anxiety for, for that reason. What's the basic idea? The basic idea is that once you are, you are A, convinced that you need to change something, so that's the kind of step, and B, you're, trying, you're beginning to work on your behavior, your behavior and your cognition together feed back into your emotions. Because your emotions, both according to this, this, this was a, the stoic intuition 2,000 years ago, but it turns out to be com, uh, uh, confirmed by modern cognitive science. Uh, we think of emotions as things that we have no control over. And some level of emotional response, we don't actually have control. Like if, uh, uh, if I were uh, coming all of a sudden very close to you and make a really loud noise, right, you would be startled and you had no control over that. One. That's, not, that's not something you can do. There's nothing you can do about it. But mature emotions, uh, which are at the root of things like anxiety. So let's take anxiety. Anxiety, uh, in, in a certain sense, is a constant fear that something bad is going to happen. Okay. And... That's, a con that's cognitively reinforced. You constantly think that there is something that is actually going to go wrong. And in fact, you have all sorts of scenarios about what could possibly go wrong. Um, in other words, your brain, your cognition, your, 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 um, uh, ra reason, your rational thinking is actually feeding into that emotion. And it's a feedback. So what CBT uh, therapy and stoic, stoic practice are trying to do 
uh, is to break that, that cycle. Once you start changing your behavior, your behavior feeds back into your emotions, your emotions get a little better. That allows you to reinforce the new path at a cognitive level, which makes further behavioral changes, which further feedbacks into your emotions. And as I said, this actually works. It doesn't work 100% of the time. This, this is not a magic, magic pill. It's not a magic wand or anything like that. Uh, but it does work. CBT uh, and, um, and similar kinds of approaches like REBT, which is rational emotive behavioral therapy, uh, they, they work. They, they are empirically based. Is therefore the normalized version of these things. So my suggestion would be if you're really seriously into you know, high level of depression or anxiety, then the first step probably ought to be either a psychiatrist or a psychologist. If a psychologist, I would say a CBT practitioner would probably be a good place to start or an IDBT practitioner. But at some point, you're going to get to a level where, yeah, you feel a little bit of depression, a little bit of anxiety, but now it's kind of manageable. At that point, that's where stoicism as a philosophy kicks in. Because, of course, philosophies are not therapies. Uh, therapies are supposed to be for, the, for, for immediate problems and sort of short term. Uh, stoicism is a philosophy. It's for life and, and it's long term. Right? So once you get to the point of being able to somewhat manage uh, your anxiety or your depression, etc., then stoic philosophy really helps because it basically amplifies all of what I just said and it applies it to every aspect of, of your life. Um, now, we haven't talked about how you actually practice stoicism because that's, you know, it's, as we, we'd be saying that it's a practical philosophy, but, you know, other than the references to CBT, I haven't actually said anything about practice. There's a number of exercises. Um, uh, people that, uh, can look it up on, uh, so my book ends with a chapter of, with uh, 24 different exercises that people can practice. Well, um, actually, Massimo, yeah. like, while, we're, while we're doing this now, it would be good if, I think, if we could, if you could give three practical exercises, poss if they can possibly sort of graft onto this idea of regret, hopelessness, and worry, that would be great. But if not, just three exercises that people can go away as like a, a Stoicism 101, something to just get you started. Right, right. right. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't going to get into all 24 exercises. In fact, um, the number of exercises that are listed that, that we came up with, a friend of mine and I are actually putting together a fairly comprehensive list now of exercises for a new book. And we come up with literally hundreds uh, that are, you know, sort of taken from the, from the stoic literature. Um, but yes, there are some basic ones um, that are really important. Um, one that I do every day is the uh, evening diary, philosophical diary. So Seneca says every night before going to bed, uh, take a few minutes, uh, get into a quiet corner of your house or your apartment, um, and then start writing down a short uh, summary of your thoughts about the important things that happened to you during the day. The things where you had to make decisions, uh, where you think you failed or you did well. And for each one of these, ask yourself three questions. One, what did I do wrong? Two, what did I do right? And three, what could I have done better? Uh, what's the idea? You ask yourself what you, what you did wrong, not because you want to sort of you know, beat yourself up and say, ah, see, I did something wrong, but because you want to learn about your mis from your mistakes. And then, importantly, he says, you want to set them aside. Once you learn from your mistakes, since your, your past is outside of your control, you set them aside. You sort of gently put them out of your mind. The reason you put them on paper is because that way you put them out of your mind. Um, the second one is, you know, what I do right? Well, because you ought to pat yourself on the back if you did something right. Uh, mm -hmm. You, you want to learn also from your positive experiences. You want to reinforce the fact that you are fundamentally a good human being. You're trying hard to make progress. And so, yeah, good for you now, if you did something right. And then the third one is, you know, what, what did you do that you could have done differently? The reason for that, again, it's not to indulge in regret. Oh, I should have done it this way. The idea is, look, a lot of the situations in your life would actually come back over and over. Um, you know, we experience similar situations uh, repeatedly, you know, interactions with colleagues, interactions with friends and so on and so forth. Right. And, and uh, if you pay attention when you do something that is not quite optimal, then when you do something that's not quite ideal, you pay attention, say, OK, well, the next time that's going to happen, here's what I'm going to do. 
uh, you are essentially preparing yourself for future action. And a prepared mind is a mind that does better when the next emergence, uh, come, emergency comes, comes in. So that's one exercise, the evening uh, philosophical diary. It's an exercise of reflection, learning from yourself, and also it's an exercise in self-forgiveness because you set yeah. it aside. And down, you set it aside. Yeah, interestingly, Massimo, that, I, don't, I don't know if you... Have you heard of James Pennebaker? I think University of Texas. He's actually done a lot of research on this idea of getting people to write write things down whether it's traumatic experiences just things that they've things that are stuck in mind that might be bothering them and he's he's got actually a lot of like empirical research that actually demonstrates long-term health benefits of actually yeah. just getting these thoughts out and onto paper so that's yeah, yeah exactly. definitely yeah exactly and so that's one of the things about the stoicism that strikes me as really interesting is that um not everything of course that the stoics said pans out according to modern science, but a lot of it does. Uh, they had a really good intuitions. They were good observers of the of human psychology and, and the human mind. Um, they have good intuitions about how to deal with things. So that's one exercise. Um, another practice that I do uh, on a regular basis is the so-called premeditatio malorum, which is Latin for uh, roughly translated to thinking about bad shit happens, happening. Um, so, um, so here's the, how it works. You, uh, it's, a, it's a visualization exercise. You close your eyes and you imagine yourself in a situation uh, that you don't like, in a, in a situation that you don't feel comfortable, that you, 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 don't, you don't look forward to. And you do that very deliberately and very slowly as if you were looking at a movie of that situation, okay? Uh, and then you play in your head, in your mind several times over and over. Uh, this can be applied to minor things or to major things. Uh, let's say a job interview, for instance, right? That you fear might be going badly. Or there's a friend of mine who applies that to getting into the subway in the morning during commute, during, during rush hour. He hates that. He absolutely hates that, right? Um, and so he does that. He, so he, he closes his mind and he visualizes this thing. Now, why would you want to do that, right? Why, why would you want to indulge in these kind of things? Turns out, again, there is good empirical evidence that a premeditatio malorum actually is, uh, or it's in, in English is referred to as usually as negative visualization. Uh, it tends to work because the idea is not to dwell on the negative experience. The idea, in fact, it's kind of the opposite, is to familiarize yourself with the negative experience. And then you conclude the meditation by saying to yourself out loud, if you need to, well, that's not just, that's not really that much of a big deal, is it? I can deal with that. I can, I can imagine, you know, surviving this kind of thing. There's worse things that happen, that could happen. Um, and the idea of that is, is um, that A, you familiarize yourself with what may happen. You prepare yourself for the worst possible outcome. And in fact, many of the times, the worst possible outcome, outcome does not materialize. You know, you go for a job interview, sometimes you will get the job. <laughs> it's not like it's guaranteed that you don't, right? Yep. Um, so you're prepared mentally to what happens if you do do not get the job and you say, OK, well, that's part of life. I, you know, I'm going to go back and try again and try and learn from the experience. But you were prepared. So it's not a shock. It's not you don't react angrily. You don't, you know, uh, get pissed off at something or because you expected it. That's that's what uh, that was part of the outcome. But also there's the possibility that you actually do get the job and therefore you're kind of relieved and you're, sort of, you're ecstatic about the fact that, ah, I thought it was going to go this way, but in fact, it's gone better. Uh, again, there is empirical evidence that this kind of stuff actually does work, although people need to be careful about in, uh, uh, doing a negative visualization and start with small things, things like, uh, you know, oh, the, the subway crowd or something like that. Um, because there are some people, for instance, who use the negative visualization to imagine the, the death of a loved one or even their own death. And I've done that, and it's a good exercise because it actually does um, help you overcome your fear of death, of your own demise, which is something that we all have. But if that's how you start, that can be overwhelming. If you're not ready, I, I would say go, you know, go slow and, and don't, don't begin with the, with the big stuff. Yeah, well, I think the two sort of correlates there may be with um, the idea of exposure therapy in CBT. Yeah, um, but that on, on the second point is also the idea of graded exposure as well. So like you say, starting small and building up from there to sort of, yeah, build up your tolerance maybe. Correct. So, um, the, third on, 
that I would suggest is um, it's actually a practical exercise in also tolerance, but it's not a visualization. It's not a meditation. It's an actual practical exercise. And this is, this has to do with uh, self deprivation exercises. So the Stoics were big to do these little, this, this mild exercise in self deprivation. We're not talking about anything, you know, dangerous or anything so particularly unpleasant, but let me give you a few examples. So what I do on a regular basis, uh, not every day, but, Okay. Uh, from time to time, I take a cold shower. Now, you would say, why Why on earth would you want to take a cold shower? Right? It's no, I'm a convert, Massimo. Yeah, it's going to be unpleasant, right? Uh, and it is. Uh, but it has, actually has a lot of interesting uh, sort of positive aspects to it. First of all, the idea of a, a self-deprivation exercise is one of endurance, right? You say, okay, I can, I can do it. But I can do it. It's not, it's not the end of the world. I can turn on off the, 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 the hot water and it's going to be fine. I'm, 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 it's going to be unpleasant, but it's, you know, it's not, not a big deal. So one is practicing your endurance. The second one is uh, to remind yourself that you're lucky normally to have a hot shower available because <laughs> lots of people don't. Um, and and um, so you kind of, it becomes, becomes also an exercise in appreciation of what you have, essentially. Mm. Right? Um, Turns out also in the case of specifically of the hot shower, it, uh, modern medicine, the Stoics did not do, did, did not know this, but modern medicine tells you that it actually also has boosting effect on your immune system. So, you know, that's, it's also good for your health in general. Uh, but you do it as mostly as an exercise in, in endurance and in appreciation of what you normally have. Um, similarly, you can, I do um, once or twice a week, I fast either for a day uh, uh, or for a day and a night, depending on the situation. And again, it's not pleasant, right? Because you get hungry at some point. You say, oh, all right, I wish I had a, you know, a good meal tonight. Well, true, but it's certainly endurable. It's not like, you know, it's not a big deal. You can, you can definitely do it. And again, the idea is that, first of all, you train your willpower, basically. You train yourself to say, okay, I can do this. It's a challenge. It's like when you go to the gym, and, and your instructor says, okay, you have only lifted up to this weight. Now let's try 10 pounds more. And you say, oh, I can't do that. Yes, you can. You know, try it a little bit. He didn't say 100 pounds more. He just said 10. And you can definitely do that, right? And it feels hard, but then you can do it. So that's part of the reason. Um, but it's also, again, the same idea that uh, if you fast for 24 hours or 48 hours once in a while, you wouldn't believe just how good the next meal is going to feel, you know, and taste, no matter what you eat. <laughs> yeah, but again, there's, um, there's health benefits to fasting as well, so. Right, exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay, sort of, so, sort of bringing this to a close now, um, what I'm interested in, Massimo, is whether um, since you've sort of become a convert to this and, and, and practicing Stoicism, have you seen I know you say other people have have noticed things about you, but from your own personal perspective, has there maybe been a sort of a, a repetition of, of of incidents that you've noticed a difference in your own reaction? So, I mean, I don't know if you what anything that you'd be comfortable sharing, but you know, maybe something that maybe happened in your twenties, thirties that you didn't deal with quite so well that again has happened since you've converted, if that's the right word, to stoicism. Right. And you've realized in yourself, like, wow, this has actually made a difference. Right. Yes, there are. Uh, yeah, I don't particularly like the word converted because it sounds a lot like a religious thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> I just say, you know, I started practicing. But uh, it's like, again, it's like going to the gym, really. It's, it's, it's supposed to be a, a gym for your mind, a mental, mental gym, um, as opposed to sort of physical one. But yes, there have been a number of cases like that. Uh, there's one that I talked a little bit about in, in my book that I... That I that struck me as particularly representative. So um, about last year, I was in Rome for several months uh, where I grew up, it's my, my city, even though I live in New York now. Um, and um, uh, I, I had an appointment with my brother and his wife for, to go out for dinner and a movie. And so I got into the subway. And something strange happens is this guy in front of me that sort of pushes back really hard as if the subway were crowded, but he was not that crowded. And so I thought for a second, I was like, what, what is this guy doing? And then I realized that a minute, you know, a second too late, he was simply distracting me. He was picking my pocket basically and lifting my, my, my wallet, right? 
And so normally I would have been really upset. I mean, and as soon as I realized that I turned around, but they were already out of the subway, the, 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 the doors were closing and that was it. Now, these kind of thing have happened, and if that, this kind of thing had happened, you know, a few years ago or 10 years or 20 years ago, I would have gotten got really pissed and would say, you know, what a stupid idiot you are. You know, how can you possibly allow that to happen, especially in your own city? You should know to be more careful. You know, you should be paying attention. And now it's going to be a mess because, you know, you know, you lost money and the credit cards and the driver license, blah, blah. It would have been, the rest of the evening would have been ruined and I would have been feeling miserable, blah, blah, blah. blah. Instead, because of ongoing stoic training, the very first thing, I swear to you, the very first thing that came to mind was, what is under your control here? Right? So right. Epictetus 101. And I say, okay, uh, your wallet is no longer under your control. That's gone. So <laughs> there's nothing you can do about it. Um, uh, the thieves are you know, probably celebrating and getting a drink. Well, good for them. They, they bested me. They, they were smarter than I am. So... You know, fine, good for them. They're having a drink on me. Now, what is under my control? Well, I can step out of the subway at the next stop and pick up my, my phone, call the credit card companies uh, and block the credit card, which I did. Uh, I can go, I can use my phone and go on the web and go to the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles and block my license, my driver's license and request a new one, which I did. 10 minutes later, when I met up with my, uh, with my brother, uh, he didn't even realize that something happened. You know, during the, the rest of the evening, I told him, I said, oh, by the way, I, I lost my wallet. I said, really? Oh, what happened? Blah, blah. Well, nothing. It's like, you know, these, these kind of things happen and, you know, you just, just, just move on and you focus immediately on the things that is inside, inside your control as opposed to outside. So that kind of stuff has happened since I started practicing in different kinds of circumstances. You know, there's a number of issues where, I lose something or something happens to me or, I, or, or uh, something doesn't go the way that I would have preferred it to go. And immediately now, my mind almost automatically goes to, okay, in this particular circumstances, what's under your control and what is not under your control? The stuff that you, under, not, not under your control, let it go. The stuff yeah. under your control, focus on that one. By the way, I, it's not easy, of course, to let go of things that are not under your control. I'm not suggesting this is easy, but it has become easier for me with practice, right? Month after month and year after year, it actually becomes easier. But the thing that helps, especially early on, is precisely the cognitive recognition that, okay, that stuff is not under my control, so I can't do anything about it. What can I do, however? So if you immediately focus your mind and sort of you, you redirect your attention to the things that you can do, to whatever it is that you actually can uh, make actionable, so to speak, then that makes it easier to accept that there are things that are not under your control because your mind is occupied, you know, getting stuff done. You feel like you're making progress. You feel like you're taking charge of something. And so it's easier to let go of the stuff that you can't do anything about. Okay, perfect. Uh, Massimo, could I keep you for five more minutes to run some quick fire questions past you? Sure. Okay, uh, well, firstly, um, apart from your own, which I will include in the show notes, which is how to be a stoic, um, yes. do you have any book recommendations for the listeners? Yes, there are several good books uh, about stoicism that have come out uh, recently. Um, if people are interested in a very practical approach to it, uh, there is a book by Donald Robertson. Um, um, of course, now the, the, the title escapes me, but um, he's a CBT uh, practitioner. Uh, and he's, he's very good at sort of putting the thing in, in perspective, in the perspective of modern cognitive behavioral therapy. So uh, check out Donald Robertson's books. I think it's The Art of, yeah, The Art of Living or something like that. Uh, there is also a, um, uh, a nice book by uh, William Irvine uh, that's called um, The Joy of, of Living. Um, and um, that's also a modern take on stoicism. It's, it's got... A little bit of theory and a little bit of practice it's kind of a nice mix between those two things uh they're also i would i would recommend to actually read uh the ancient stoics the nice thing about the ancient stoics is they're actually very readable uh you know if you pick up seneca or epictetus or marcus Aurelius, they sound like your friends they, they, they sound like you know, somebody who speaks to you very plainly and very, very easily. There are lots of good translations of these things, of these books, uh, especially new ones, because since Stoicism has come back into vogue, 
um, and into general interest, there have been new translations of all of these, of the major Stoics. Uh, in particular, I suggest uh, um, the University of Chicago Press has put out uh, the complete Seneca um, over the last two or three years. And so it's, I think it's four or five books um, and you can pick up any of those. I would, I would recommend starting with the letters to his friend Lucilius. They're called the philosophical letters or, or something like that, um, or letters on ethics, sometimes they're referred to. And it, it's a wonderful um, way of approaching Stoicism because these are personal letters that the guy wrote to his friend. And he's talking about, he's giving advice to his friend based, in, based, based on Stoic philosophy. So it's very personal. Um, it's day-to-day, -day, you know, occurrences, things that happen to them. You know, at one point, Seneca is complaining about the fact that he can't write because there's noise coming from the street. You know, I, I, can, I can relate to that sort of stuff. I live in New York. <laughs> um, and also, you get an interesting sort of charming, uh, you know, glimpse of what uh, life was like in, in, in Roman times. So it's, it's really nice. So I would say a combination of one or two modern books and, and, and certainly the three big ones of the ancient ones, Seneca, uh, Marcus Aurelius' Meditations, and Epictetus' uh, Discourses. Um, the other thing that is going to be useful probably to practitioners is two, two suggestions. One is there is a large Facebook community devoted to modern Stoicism. It's got like 35,000 members and it's really a, a kind of a mutual aid community. So people post questions either about the philosophy or about the practice. Uh, and then a bunch of other people. I, I'm on, on there regularly. Uh, Don Robertson is there regularly. In fact, he's the administrator of the page. And so it's a nice, so vibrant community for people who need practical suggestions on how to move forward. Uh, and finally, there is a thing called uh, the Stoic Fellowship. You can find them online. And the Stoic Fellowship is basically a directory of uh, every known local Stoic group. There may be a Stoic group in your, in your town, um, that, you know, people that actually practice Stoicism and, and meet regularly. There are two in New York, for instance. I run one of them, and a friend of mine runs another one. Uh, and you can go to the Stoic Fellowship and look up your city and, uh, and see if there's already somebody who is doing it. And if not, then you can start your own, register with the Stoic Fellowship, and, uh, and then from that point on, anybody in your city who is looking for some, some for, for a local group will know that you're trying to do that. Okay, perfect. Well, plenty to keep people going there. And as always, I will include, track all the links down, I'll include all those in the show notes. Um, okay, so firstly, what's the best piece of life advice anyone's ever given you? Ah, oh, gosh. Uh... <laughs> Um, I would have to say, you know, this, this might be cheating, but I think it's Epictetus. Um, and the best piece of advice that he has ever given is that some things are under your control and other things are not. And if you want to live a good life, you better keep that distinction in mind. Okay. What mistakes do you continue to make despite knowing better? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I keep making the mistake of thinking that people are going to behave differently from what they behave in the past. <laughs> so I have expectation that applies to myself, actually. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, they don't. Most of the times people don't change. Um, but uh, thanks to the stoic practice, I developed a little bit more tolerance for these kind of things. Um, in fact, uh, Marcus Aurelius explicitly says in the meditation, he's, he, he, tell, he tells himself because meditations were his own diary, his personal diary, basically. And so he tells himself, it's like, you know, why are you expecting people to change? That's, that's foolish. That's, that's, you know, it's not going to happen. So you have to deal with them on their own terms, on the way, the way they actually are and not the way you would like them to be. Okay. All right. Final two, the big ones. Outside of family and academia, what investment of time or money has brought you, brought you the most joy or fulfillment? Outside of family or academia, travel probably. Uh, traveling in places that are interesting because they're different from what I'm used to, uh, you know, see, have, have some kind of experience of uh, how people live in other places and, and, and how cultures can be so different from the one that I'm familiar with. So probably travel, I would say, yeah. Okay, it's a popular answer. Okay, the big one, and interesting, maybe this one from a stoic perspective, what do you think is the key to happiness? <laughs> um, 
the gift to uh, the, the 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 key to happiness i think is um to develop and pursue goals that you think are worthwhile you have to feel like in order to be a happy person i think you have to feel like you're doing something that is worth doing um uh, Seneca at one point says that uh, uh, the worst possible answer to the question, what did you do today, is nothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Right. So it, it, I think there's pretty good evidence that that's actually a fairly uh, human universal. That is, we feel, you know, we get meaning out of life um, and because we do projects that we think are worthwhile doing. Uh, and that's what I mean by... Uh, being happy being happy just means doing something that you think it's worthwhile okay well on that note massimo i hope you feel like you've done something worthwhile this past hour um <laughs> i've really enjoyed it it's been been very interesting um is there any links that you'd like to direct the listeners to like have you got a website or are you on social media any any of those things feel free to plug away yes uh thank you i i'm on twitter at um uh m p l u c c i m p i g l i u c c i and um and yes then my blog how to be a stoic.org okay perfect massimo pilucci got yes. it again <laughs> thank you very much it was a pleasure thank you